stream. I am very excited today to be joined by Dr. David Davika Dutt and uh, Dr. Serbi Kesar. And we are going to chat a little bit, or maybe a lot, about decolonizing economics and uh, what that means. So, hello everybody, say hello to me in chat. About so that I, have I just, oh, oh my God, I've just, uh, sorry, one second. I've just doubled over on my audio because I was listening to myself to make sure it's come through. All right. This is the kind of, yeah. Professional stuff we expect at Unlearning <laughs> Economics. Are you all, are you all going to say hi in the chat or not and confirm to me that you're all there? Come on. <laughs> I think they're there. I think they're there. All right. So, um, so, uh, yes. Hello, everybody. Hello. Excellent. Great, great, great. Okay. We've got 36 people straight away. Um, so, yeah. Um, by the way, you two, I've uh, put the YouTube in the chat. Oh, that's a lot of hellos. I've put the YouTube link in the chat. So if you want to, like, go on it and, like, you, you can see the chat and how the whole stream's looking with a little bit of a delay, you can, you can see that and you can maybe keep up with it because people will be asking questions and stuff. So and how the whole stream's looking. Yeah, uh, just did the same thing I did. Yeah, it happens. Um, so, so. Let me introduce my guests and allow them to introduce themselves as well. Um, so, Serbi is a lecturer in, econ in economics at the School of Oriental and African Studies, or SOAS, in London. Um, so, Serbi, uh, you go first. Could you just tell us like a little bit about your, your academic background and your research interests, please? Um, hi, thank you. Very excited to be here. So, I did my PhD in economics from South Asian University, in New Delhi. And I've been a Fulbright Fellow at uh, UMass Amherst. And prior to joining SOAS, I've been an Assistant Professor of Economics at Azim Premji University, where I'm now a visiting faculty. My ongoing work kind of deals with this question of labor and informality in labor surplus economies, particularly talking about uh, the issue of capitalist transition and structural transformation um, in post-colonial economies. And uh, I've been working on political economy of the impact of COVID-19 pandemic, uh, relations between the idea of uh, identity and social exclusion, particularly in India, uh, some critical engagement with theories of identity, and currently with Devakam working on a co-authored book project on decolonizing economics. Well, thank you. That is, that is a lot. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we'll get into that in a little bit. Um, but Devika, uh, so you, are currently the the Berg Ruin Fellow at the University of Southern California, right? Um, but also, congratulations, because you're soon going to start as a lecturer in development economics at King's College London, right? Um, yes. So, yeah. yeah. So could you tell us a little bit more about, about yourself and your research interests? Yeah, absolutely. So... Um... Um, as you just mentioned, uh, I'm a Bergeron Fellow. There are several other fellows as well okay. uh, at the University of Southern California. Um, I'm part of the Bergeron Institute's Future of Capitalism Fellowship Program. Um, my, I just finished my PhD in economics uh, from the University of Massachusetts in Amherst, where I met Serbi when she was visiting <laughs> as a Fulbright Fellow. Um, um, my, my work is about um, looking at... Um, international money, currency regimes, et cetera. Uh, my dissertation research was about um, uh, how central banks manage, um, especially if you're outside, if, especially in developing countries, how they manage being part of a monetary system that is um, predominantly uh, denominated in the US dollar and what that means geopolitically. Um, I, as Serbi mentioned, we're working on a book together, which is looking at decolonizing economics. That's one of the projects that I'm working on currently. However, I'm also trying to um, build up on my dissertation research to think about how we can build um, an international monetary system that is more equitable and not based on the US dollar. So um, yeah, that's a new project, very nascent, but that's what I'm doing right now. Excellent, excellent. Yeah, so again, all of those things I'm, I'm really interested in discussing. So to start with, um, you both mentioned uh, Decon, or full name, Diversifying and Decolonizing Economics, right? And also how you're writing uh, a book 
uh, about about that topic. So, uh, Davika, um, you're you're like a founding member of of Decom, right? Uh, so, could you tell us a little bit about like the organization and its aims? Um, absolutely. So, I mean, just a quick detour as to why we started and how we started. Mm -hmm. uh, this was way back in I want to say 2019. 2019 is when we officially set up. Uh, but the year before that, we were kind of, um, we, we had a little group chat going and we were really angry because uh, Martin Wolf, the Financial Times has put out a list, like he puts out a list of reading list every year mm. um, about the books that, that are to read that summer. And it was like all men all writing about the US or, or Europe. And it's not that they were bad books. We just felt like this, it, to characterize these as the books to read is very sort of, uh, gendered and racial and also in terms of and also in a way um, Anglo-centric basically Eurocentric and so we didn't we didn't like that uh, and so also mostly white men yes thanks Serbi yes it was all <laughs> mostly white men and we got really annoyed about that so we wanted to put out our own reading list and we did that was it initially came out on the developing economics blog and that was kind of the starting point of what we eventually became uh, and we were also really frustrated that that in a way you could only talk about Either you talk about diversity of identity in terms of like who we are reading or what we're reading or who's on the panels, et cetera, or you talk about like plural, plural, plural economic thought. We didn't seem to think that that need to be a trade off that you could you could you have to talk about both and it's important and not only talk about it like work towards more pluralism in thought, but also in terms of like who who is who is preaching that pluralism as well. Um, and so that's where it came about. It came about more from the lens of diversity. I think that was initially our beginnings, but mostly when we started talking about it, we, as, as we progressed in our, like, what do we want to do and how do we want to do it? And what are our aims? It became immediately clear that diversity is the tip of the iceberg. And it's really not the primary thing that we're, con primary thing that we're concerned about. The primary thing we're concerned about is all the structures that lead to the fact that it's mostly white men from Northern Euro universities being deciding what is economics effectively. Uh, it was more, it's a more, it's a deeper problem of Eurocentrism of like, of, of this white, this hierarchy and white supremacy in a way, uh, which is also gendered that is manifesting in this way. And so, so eventually we've definitely evolved more towards trying to decolonize economics. And, and I guess we'll talk about like what that means. But yeah, initially we definitely started from this frustration of how it was either one or the other. And this one sort of like organizing event around which some of us got really, we were not, we were a bit mad because it would seem, it seemed, it seemed annoying, especially as, a, as an academic, as an economist. I was a PhD student at the time. Um, who is not from either the, like, I don't, I'm not a citizen of the United States or of any European nation or the UK for that matter. And uh, well, look at me, <laughs> it seemed, it seemed in a way, and I'm also, I'm, I'm a heterodox economist. So it seemed like a confluence of personal versus and things that I believe like politically as well and academically that is important that, that came about in a nice sort of um, crescendo that is, Decon. So that's how it started. Um, that was a long answer. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, no, it was great. It was great. Please, please. Long answers are what we're here for. Uh, that was really comprehensive. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, I think you put it really well, you know, it, it's, it's just it always seems like a bit of an astonishing coincidence that all of the best, apparently the best stuff is written about the USA uh, and, and by white dudes when obviously like there's a whole load of other stuff out there that we, we just don't really see um so yeah i mean um i guess i guess uh i could ask i could ask about about the book um and serbi i guess i'll give you a chance to talk here so i suppose the book is a name to express all of that so um do you have any more specifics are you allowed to tell us yet what the book's going to be like um sure i mean i i guess uh, before i get into the book it might be good to kind of just talk about how is it that one is conceptualizing this idea of uh, Eurocentrism in economics, you know, like why is economics Eurocentric? And that's one of the basic questions that we are also asking in the book. And kind of one thought that I could share is that 
uh, you know, we're we're looking at Devika's already talked about various manifestations and how you know it's uh, reflected in structures of academia, but also when we're talking about Europe centrism, we're talking about this idea of a metaphorical Europe, right? And what is this metaphorical Europe is something that we're trying to unpack. So the idea in economics is that this endogenous capitalist development in Europe and the associated you know values of enlightenment with rationality and objectivity, so on and so forth are considered like the central point of the understanding in much of economic theory. And all the realities elsewhere that do not conform to this idea are merely seen as deviations or aberrations from the European experience. The kind of favorite example I like to uh, give, which was actually given to be again, um, to me by when I was studying development economics is that uh, by my teacher then, who said that development economics as a whole discipline comes into being because the idea was economics as a discipline can't really explain these aberrant phenomena in the economies of the global south. So we needed a special discipline because you know normal economics doesn't apply to us. So we need the special discipline of development economics to make sense of our reality. So the entire discipline was based on just aberrations, studying these aberrations. So in that sense, um, Europe comes to become or economics comes to be Eurocentric because Europe came to represent what we call the essence of capitalism. So it is that essence of capitalism that Europe represents. And with that, all the ideas, all the institutions, all the identities, all the rationalities that conform to that idea of capitalism kind of become the center. And everything else that does not align to this understanding becomes an aberration and just a deviation, which we need to correct. Therefore, this, you know, there's an exclusion of different kinds of strands that do not celebrate this vision of capitalism. And the exclusion becomes even more intensive when we're talking about South-centric strands. So it is by no coincidence that heterodox theories are in fact marginalized even in the global north because the kind of roots of it comes into this colonization of the discipline, which of course, as we know, which is a problem, even within the heterodox theory that the marginalization becomes even more enhanced in let's say something from strands which take post-colonial economies as the starting point or identities or rationalities or institutions that don't conform to that locus uh, of an understanding. And the book kind of tries to develop on this a lot more in terms of talking about how eco economics came to be a Eurocentric discipline, how it came to be colonized, why is mainstream colonized, to what extent do heterodox theory allow for us, uh, allow it to be decolonized, but to what extent are they colonized as could they be colonized as well. Then we try to build some sort of provide some building blocks from critical theories to talk about how a decolonized frameworks and theories could look like. We talk about issues of pedagogy, we talk about issues of curriculum policy and how to engage with this issue of decolonizing in various such spaces. So I, I, that's kind of, in my mind, the you know, map of the book per se. And uh, Devika, maybe you can add more. I guess I just wanted to add an example, which was something that we wanted to respond to as well. So I think in August last year, Danny Roderick, um, who's a famous development economist, wrote this piece in Project Syndicate. Uh, about um, there's like there's economics has another diversity problem and he was talking about geographical diversity about how you know as you said that it so happens it's no accident by the way it's a spoiler alert <laughs> that all of the the good and the theories that we need to like all learn all over the world come from um, certain departments in the U.S. mostly U.S. some some of them might be in the U.K. Uh, and and in that in that article he said uh, oh, this this really annoyed me so much because. Because uh, I think Danny Roderick is great, but he said that um, it's different, you know, it's so important to have voices from people that are based in different places, because often this aberrant, like these aberrations are what give, give, God give insight into understanding the economy as a whole. I forget, I'm not, I'm paraphrasing, I don't remember the exact thing, I can quote it if I pull it up in a second. And the whole point was that, oh, Joe Stiglitz went to Kenya and he saw something about sharecropping and that kind of gave him this idea about imperfect information for which he eventually won the Nobel Prize, right? Um, and so, it was it was really frustrating to see that because why is it that most of the world is only serving as an aberration laboratory for you when really that's what you should be theorizing like on its own right it's not trying to it's not serving as a ground to you give to give you ideas about how the economy works 
in the global north. And I'm not trying to create like an unnecessary that you can't understand this with that. It was just the way he put it, which is really, I think, it's nothing against Danny Roderick. I think it's mostly how most uh, Northern European, Northern and Northern, Northern as in, in the global north sense, economists think and how we're trained to think that the normal economy is, as so we put it, the essence of capitalism is essentially implicitly European um, and everything else is an aberration. So I just wanted to add that example. But yeah, as far as the book goes, we're trying to develop what we mean and what we need to do to make economics better. Because at the end of the day, it's a question of scientific quality, even if you remove any aspect of justice. Uh, of course, I think we can't really remove any aspect of justice or considerations of justice from this. However, fundamentally, it's really a question of scientific quality. And we think that we're compromising on scientific quality because of these inherent biases that are built into the structures of economics. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, so, I, I mean, it, it does amaze me that essentially, if you think of economics and development economics, you know, with economics focused on the richer countries, essentially what you're doing is excluding the majority of the world's population from from what you deem economics and then and then calling everything else something different and it and it's you know even even the word um development economics as well right the word development seems to imply that you know these countries are somehow behind and if they were developed then they would they would be you know on the right track they would be included in in economics um and there are so many different contexts i mean one of the examples i've heard um of of how economics can be very different in different contexts just a little example was um that of the nigerian firm and how in nigeria and i'm sure this this must be true in some other countries as well the firm is very much a family uh a family entity a family enterprise right and to think of it as a profit maximizing firm as standard neoclassical economics does is just completely wrong right um yeah so there's there's so many of these examples and so many things that you're just excluding with these assumptions, right? Um, Serbi, you want to start? Uh, sure. I mean, I, I could add a couple of things here. First of all, you know, this is uh, this is based on a different paper that I'm working on uh, labor from, um, you know, different South-centric perspectives and stuff. And here it's it blows my mind how wage employment, which is kind of the essence of capitalist economies, is something that's not always the dominant form in the economies in the global south, for example, in fifty percent, uh, fifty percent of India's uh, you know workforce is employed in segments that are basically marked by family-based enterprises without hiring any hired labor. So there's an absence of a capital wage labor relationship. Most of these enterprises tend to be subsistence driven. They are mainly of the kind that would be focusing on reproducing the. Uh, household dynamics and the you know meeting the consumption needs of the household rather than rather than being driven by an accumulation motive. There's income sharing that continues to go on, so on and so forth. So of course these are not seen. And what happens is that in much of the development economics as a discipline, as so as you talked about, from Lewis onwards, the idea has been that with economic growth there would be an eventually withering away of these non-capitalist segments which, I mean, I'm characterizing them as non-capitalist, not to say they're outside of capitalism, they're very much within capitalism. But the fact that these entities are assumed to be withering away with economic growth is something that's how transition or development would happen. Here, if you look into it, what is happening is development is being defined in a very particular way. And that is no accident. It is politically defined. The categories of development and underdevelopment are as if defined to be neutral categories, but they're in fact something which is a completely capitalist economy, vis-a-vis -vis something that has these other structures of production existing as well. So it is in that sense a political categorization that happens, which is then obfuscated because you don't want to see how these hierarchies and dynamics are created. And there's been this complete depoliticization of how knowledge is produced or what kind of theories are advanced, which this project of decolonization kind of tries to combat and say that 
look, knowledge production is essentially a political process. And, you know, even when development economics as a discipline is getting born, mm. it's very interesting because we're talking about sovereign post-colonial economies who are now trying to think about development on their own terms. But, you know, there's uh, 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 Rist has this really interesting quote, which I'm paraphrasing, which says that, you know, you can vote political sovereignty, but you can't really vote in intellectual sovereignty. And that is exactly what happens in this entire post-World War period for post-colonial economies, that this intellectual colonization continued to happen. And, uh, and you know, it now gets reflected in terms of, there's so many papers, who, papers which get rejected uh, because, uh, you know, at least I got a rejection from one of the uh, good mainstream journals to basically say, which was an analysis of the entire Indian economy's employment, you know, and basically the, they said that this is um, something which is a very specific case or something. It was literally based on the national level panel data over the period of high growth for the entire Indian economy. You won't get that comment if I was writing a paper on the US economy. Is India that important? Mm, uh, that's, that's a question for the editors. And <laughs> even the editors of the big development journals, most of them are basically people based in the global North universities, particularly in the US. So it's no surprise that these kind of biases continue to manifest. Oh, Devika, do you want to come in here? Oh, um, I guess just very quickly, I think just to supplement what Surbi said that based on, uh, I mean, as I said, I'm not a development economist, I'm a macroeconomist, but to add to that, like as I mentioned before, it's a question of scientific quality because a lot of even within global North economies, we're ignoring so many phenomena that have been occurring in like global South economies forever, basically. And we have no idea how to theorize them because we have a very sort of narrow lens of how to view the economy. For instance, informality. Like now initially with the, with the gig economy, what is the gig economy? Is it not a form of informal economy, which has been like, that's been the norm in most of the world for a long time. Look at inflation today. So much of inflation in, in developing economies is structural. That's another way of saying that a lot of it is because of supply constraints. And today we're seeing infl global inflation driven by um, issues of the supply chain and and again because we're so set in our ways in terms of policy and in terms of theory on viewing like the Phillips curve type relation of demand side inflation that it's so hard for central bankers and like economists <laughs> to deal with this new form of inflation which isn't really new um, but yeah, just, just it doesn't it doesn't need to be a separation of like this is global north economics, this is global south economics. That's not what we're saying. It's that like we need to reform all of it because it is a question of like how we look at the world and how we understand the world, not just in the global south. Um, yes. Just yeah. Like to... yeah. No, carry on, please. <laughs> okay, sorry. Just to jump on the point on informality, you know, uh, Guy Stand Standing says that this is the new working class, you know, the precariat. But it's not new. And even, you know, when we're talking about this is non-standard, it's not non-standard. It's been the most standard for majority of the world, really, when we're talking about informality. And the same thing happens when, you know, we're having conversations about standard uh, of, uh, you know, future of work. And non-standard work arrangements kind of become the part of future work. There's been so much literature from Latin America, from African economies, from South Asia, which has been talking about informality for so long, but everybody needs to reinvent the wheel and think about these questions from, again, that not centric perspective without even understanding how these, uh, you know, ideas have been theorized uh, for, for, for really long in these economies. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. That was really interesting. Um, I was also panickedly upgrading my Zoom then because it was about to time to time out. So I just it's, uh, anyway, it's it's now you're not going to suddenly be cut off. Um, but, yeah, so um, the the kind of professionalism that we get on the Unlearning Economics channel. So yeah, um, God, yeah, there's so much to talk about here. I mean, I think one of one of the interesting points that I think has come up in this modern uh, decolonization movement which is i think has only really come into the spotlight over the past few years uh really uh is is this depoliticization right because there there's there's i guess you could say people have taken like two different approaches right there's one that's kind of almost a purely academic approach to say we need to change the curriculum um, let's include more thinkers from the global south 
in our readings, um, ideas from the global south. Let's, you know, use data from India, for example. Let's do all of these things, and those would all be good things. But then what you're talking about, I think, from listening to you now and also from knowing a little bit about Decon as an organization is that there's actually a bit of a more radical, more political critique. Because certainly, I mean, it strikes me that if you would say you were talking about decolonizing academia in you know, the, the 40s and 50s. It would be absurd not to say, well, also let's actually get rid of colonialism, right? You, you, you would have to, you would be forced to say that as soon as you use the word decolonization. And I think uh, for, for many people who want to decolonize economics in this more radical sense, they would say that there are these colonial structures that are bigger than just maybe what's on the course outline and we also need to address those. So I don't know, maybe it's, there's quite a big question, I guess, but maybe if you could talk a little bit about that. Um, so is it okay if I start? Yeah, okay, yeah. cool. I'm so glad that you brought it up because that's exactly what we're saying. We are so done with decolonizing being a box checking exercise that you like make your syllabus have more like brown people on your syllabus. That's not like, that's good in its own right. Okay, that's not, we're not saying you shouldn't do that, but don't call it decolonization. Because what we're talking about is fundamentally challenging the structures of knowledge production that maintain this kind of dissemination of knowledge from the core to the periphery, um, the core being like a handful of departments in the United States, um, th that dissemination of knowledge, which in itself has immense uh, implications for policy. I was just reading um, this wonderful paper that you mentioned in one of your, uh, not live videos, but the other videos that you did about by Foucault and all about um, superiority of economics. Mm. Yeah. And 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 they they say um, I was I forget the exact quote, but the the arrogance and um, of and hubris of economists is so important and so dangerous because at the end of the day we are making the world we are making the world in in the in in the image of how we see that world and that's why like this this particular decolonization can not only be academic it ha it has to be academic plus. Um, and in that way, as Serbi said, like all knowledge production is political and therefore it does it, it's not enough for us to sit in our ivory towers, which is, which is what we would be doing if we don't add this political element to it. And so for instance, I mean, um, so Serbi and you're based in the UK and so you, you, can, you can see what's happening around you. I mean, the huge sort of cuts in um, higher education and a lot of people are on, were on strike, faculty were all on strike for a while. And, you know, on this, we have to talk about how it's related to the neoliberal university, because how can you even think about like decolonizing your knowledge production if people don't have, you know, they don't have any kind of job security. And this is fundamentally tied to a larger process of decolonization in, in like academics, in academia, in the global north. <clears throat> Similarly, um, I can talk about like, specifically in my area of like research interests, we look at the IMF, you know, I'm not saying you can decolonize the IMF, that's not what I'm saying. But the point is that the, um, the things that form the policy advice of the IMF is very much coming from that sort of singular worldview, even though the IMF has country offices everywhere, they have economists from all over the world. However, you have to talk in a specific language, you have to like conform to certain theories to do, to do anything there. So this is what I mean, like we need to challenge that and it's part and parcel. So, I mean, I would always tell my students that, you know, if there's a strike outside, you gotta go join it, don't cross the picket line. <laughs> And on top of that, it's very important to be politically engaged because no economics is neutral. I think the mainstream pretends that they're neutral and their theories are neutral. It's not, nothing is neutral. Um, and I, yeah, so I'm, yeah, Serbi, go ahead. I feel like you're far more eloquent on me than me on this. <laughs> not at all. Um, I'll just pick up on something that you just said that, uh, you know, when we're teaching the students, the idea is also when we talk about decolonization, how do you go you know, beyond that, just including this brown woman uh, in your curriculum or in your department and so on and so forth, is we're talking about theories that fundamentally lend itself for us to understand processes that facilitate colonization, that facilitate racialization, so on and so forth. 
and you know that is something at every moment of rupture that has happened economically to kind of just draw that link between political conditions and what's been happening in academia when the 2008 economic crisis happened there were students across the world of economics in mainstream universities who were angry that what kind of economics are we being taught that we couldn't see such a huge crisis coming our way similarly the entire uh, issue on identity based inequality that's become so much more important now in economics with the uh, black lives matters movement which has kind of become you know particularly took off in the in the last few years and when we are talking about the roads must fall movement and when we talk about the dalit lives matter movement so it is like those it's you know the world isn't just out there there is that kind of interaction that's happening which is which we need to import in our theories and then see whether the kind of understandings you know whether the kind of theories of identity where the focus is just on explaining why does discrimination exist uh you know or or rather proving that discrimination does exist is that enough whether we, we can take discrimination as something that uh is something which can you know which we can in fact reform just by changing individual behaviors or are we talking about looking at the structures that produce those inequalities and discriminations how do we how do we build those frameworks and theories and i think that is kind of the task even of economists uh, so to say another thing that i wanted to say on this is that uh it's it's really interesting how economists often talk about that look our task is to study the world out there yeah but the world out there isn't just existing it has been as a result of the kind of academia we have the kind of uh, uh, institutions we have the kind of policies that we have that we are building a particular kind of world so it's not just about studying the world out there it is in fact about constructing the world out there as we are studying it and it that's kind of it's that kind of a link that academia and especially economics academia by sitting in their ivory towers tends to break they they do not want to cross that bridge and i guess a particularly ironical example of this in this particular time is the trips vaccine waiver oh my god we are in 2022 the pandemic it's been more than 2 years now and we still don't have a vaccine waiver why because uh, it's something that's not going to be profitable for you know some people some big billionaire companies sitting here and there and uh, they they've been making such profits and we see this uh, uh, you know uh, virus basically having variations after variations and infecting the whole world and we really just don't want to give up uh, trade related intellectual property rights which has been heavily argued and critiqued even within mainstream of the academia forget even heterodoxy even mainstream academics have talked about how innovation could be limited if you have intellectual property rights and patents and that's like a clear one to one quid pro quo i mean rather one to one relation that we're talking about the real world mm. and uh you know academia but of course uh, that's that's what tells us to say you know how these how real world or rather where how is it that money and who has power kind of dictates what what kind of knowledge gets accepted and produced and how to what extent can it go in order to change the structures that exist in the world out there yeah i mean i mean it's uh, it, one one of the big things and you you've mentioned it a few times is that always strikes me is the is the imf and the world bank right and how they exert an outsized influence on the policies of nominally democratic countries um and you know the US has veto power at the uh, at the IMF right it has a, a 16% of the votes or whatever it is that t- requires it to be able to veto any decision um and you know uh, all of these institutions are dominated by economists from the from the global north uh and they they they've had a big impact and especially in the past with structural adjustment policies which were very neoliberal right uh, free market privatize deregulate etc there's been this kind of direct impact on on the global south from particular types of economics um and also you know i guess you could say particular types of power in terms of these structures so that like you're saying right the two have been intertwined yes 
Absolutely. Um, especially, uh, and, and it's not only that the, that the people in charge of the IMF, for instance, are uh, people like white dudes from the global north. Gita Gopinath was the most latest. Now she's the managing director, a position that was created for her. And yeah, she's very brilliant. I'm no, no doubt about it. But um, she's in that way no different. <laughs> I mean, nothing personal against Gita Gopinath, <laughs> but, um, but the point is like, it's the training that matters. And so to go back kind of to circle back to one of the things that you said before, you know, it's that people think of decolonization as just adding brown people to your syllabus, but it doesn't, it also matters. Like, what are they saying? You know, like not all, it's not like, I don't know, we're, we're not here. I don't know, just because of the color of our skin or where we're from doesn't mean we're necessarily like more insightful or saying anything different if you're trained in the same way, you know? Um, and so I think the, the key point here is that the headquarters of the IMF is in, is in DC. And it's it's also that the headquarters of like the global monetary system is in DC because it's imposing the same rules, and and I guess like the outsized influence of the US is very it's been documented. I don't think it's any secret anymore. Um, even in so there's this I think Axel Dreher is a political scientist I believe, and he wrote a few years ago. This is about a ten year old paper I think, or even older. Um, in which he showed that the number of conditionalities that a country gets in its in the loans from the IMF is lower if you're more aligned to US foreign policy position in terms of like alignment in UN General Assembly voting record, or um, even wow. the, the nature of the conditionality is different if you're more aligned to the US foreign policy. Um, and so this is like documented. And I know we hear from the IMF that they're reformed, and, and I don't want to sort of devalue the immense work that activists have done over the decades to actually push the IMF to reform its um, institutional view, like what it generally thinks about capital controls, what it generally thinks about health expenditures, for instance. And on paper, that has reformed. In practice, the verdict's still out. Um, I recently did a study in 2020 uh, with for the ILO in which we were looking at the loan conditions of loans given out during COVID, the pandemic. I mean, the pandemic's not over, but this was only looking at 20 loans giving out during 2020. And the IMF created new instruments, which is the Rapid Financing Instrument and the RCF, Rapid Credit Facility. And the idea was that it's not gonna be the old fashioned IMF in which it takes months to negotiate a loan when you're in a balance of payments crisis, but it's gonna be immediate and it's gonna come with little to no conditionality. And, and it's true, like they, they did do that. However, if you look at the country reports, which I did, I look at like 180 of them, um, much of the advice is very much the same. <laughs> like, it's still like, it's saying, okay, yeah, don't cut health expenditure, but you know, you need to cap your public sector wage bill. How do, how do you, how do you square that? Something, <laughs> you know? um, and so uh, I'm, like, I think we're a long way from seeing real reform but I don't want to undervalue the, the amount of work activists have been doing, which also brings me back to like that knowledge production is political. Why aren't we learning from these activists? Why are we only listening to other academics who are also sitting in their ivory towers and writing about it? I think like we need to learn to talk, talk more to folks who are actually on the ground, you know, changing policy. Um, uh, Surbhi, you're muted. Sorry, I was just saying, no, they were cutting you run an RCT and show it and prove it. It doesn't count. Come on. <laughs> Got to know better than that. You're an economist. I'm sorry. <laughs> but, but that's the point. Like, it has to be more of an involved process. And that's why you can't have this sort of, like, fourth wall, I guess, between academics and, uh, and, and, I don't know, journalists and activists and other folks who might just know what they're talking about, just because they don't have a PhD doesn't mean they don't know what they're talking about. Um, so yeah, just like, I just think we need a more inclusive in that sense and less sort of gatekeepy discipline, which is, again, only the tip of the iceberg. But these are the kind of things we need to worry about. And you can't do that. We just like <clears throat> a sort of an, oh, I'm neutral. I'm not taking a stand. You have to take a stand. Everyone takes a stand on everything. So to pretend like we need to drop this pretense uh, that nothing that we're they saying is political, even history is political, it's fine. <laughs> you just need to identify your biases and it's okay with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, no, so I was going to ask, because I'm, because for, for a lot of leftists and a lot of my viewers, um, I think will be interested in this. It's like, we know about 
the kind of worst of the IMF in the 80s, especially um, in in Latin American countries and, and um, African countries too, enforcing these kind of neoliberal policies. But I feel like we're not, we don't actually know as much about the IMF right now because that was 40, 30, 40 years ago, right? Um, but your impression is that it's changed from deregulate, privatize, um, and cut everything to deregulate and privatize, except for maybe health and education expenditures. Is, is, is that a fair characterization? Well, a little bit, because, um, because so now instead of saying cut everything, they now have a, uh, that you should have, a, at least for some places, I believe these are the least developed countries of the world, that you should have um, a social spending floor. Uh, but if you talk to experts who've like watched the IMF for a while, they'd be like, that social spending floor is so low that it's very easy to meet it. And, and sometimes like it's still not met. Like that's a minimum expender you should make on, on social stuff, which is basically health education, et cetera. Um, and so, uh, and for, for an example, and also in my, in my analysis, what I did find was that in many cases where the social spending floor was not met, the IMF was still recommending fiscal consolidation, which is a new euphemism for austerity because austerity has fallen out of fashion. The <laughs> word austerity has fallen out of fashion. Um, so things, I'm not gonna like, I'm not as cynical to say that nothing is better and like everything is still crap. I'm not gonna <laughs> say that, but it's not by much, uh, still a long way to go. But in general, yes, sorry, that was, you, you have the right impression. I'm yeah. just gonna plug in my computer because it's about mm. to work. Okay. Um, so, Serbi, you mentioned RCTs as well. Um, so I know, so for background, um, for, for my viewers, um, the 2019 Nobel Prize in Economics was awarded for uh, randomized control trials um, to um, Arin, um, oh my God, I've forgotten his name, Ban Banerjee, Banerjee, right? Um, Banerjee, Banerjee, and, Esther and, uh, Duflo and Kramer. And Michael Kramer, that's it, yeah. Um, so so randomized control trials basically are like kind of conducting experiments about which policies work um often they're done in the global south uh but and they they they've become a big thing especially for the world bank um to to have like what they call evidence based policy right uh over the past maybe 2 3 decades and so that's been a change in the policy of these global institutions but Serbia you sounded like you had some some critiques of RCTs who doesn't <laughs> uh, uh, I mean of course there, there's like an internal critiques of RCTs and there's an external critiques of RCTs the internal critiques are of the kind where it is about okay how can you make RCTs work better like there are some biases that exist how do you a sample better how do you take care of various selection issues so on and so forth then there's another level of critiques who basically talk about that with the way economics uh, with the way rcts are uh, kind of going on currently in uh, various developing economies there's of course this problem of global north economists coming and again you know what they were called really alluded to coming and looking at these countries in the global south literally because that's going to give them so much publication and considering uh, you know people in the global south as lab rats and trying to create more powerful structures for themselves and also other than that there's actually often it's kind of engages with how politics uh, of the in the region are happening many a times there would in fact be if if the government's already decided that it wants to bring out certain policies it might be doing other ways which is really uh, contaminating your study and giving you results such that the kind of intervention you want is something that gives you positive results results right and that's been critiqued quite a bit and very interesting critiques come from people like Jean Dres and Ritika Khera and others in the Indian context but, and there's another kind of more external critique of our cities per se which talk about that you're talking about these interventions as if these issues of development are kind of different from these structural issues it's like poverty exists you know and you need to like just do these small tweaks and plumbing and kind of fix it Poverty is in 
fact a structural issue. Poverty doesn't exist. It is created. It is created by structures of dispossession. It's not that in, imagine a society which is non-commodified. Poverty wouldn't exist. How is it that poverty comes into being and comes and rests in the way that it does other questions? And it's those processes of that create poverty that we might be interested in. However, the plumbers today tell us that all you need to do is basically see that these people, let's say someone in XYZ village, and you don't even know whether you can replicate it all across the country, they do not have uh, uh, ways to, let's say, subsist. So you give them some microcredit loans and see how they're doing over time. Look, we're talking about structure that's constantly excluding people so that you need to make these interventions. And if you need to make these interventions, then what we are talking about is let's identify the structures that exclude the people. And that's kind of absent from this entire debate. And one thing that I'm going to say, which I think is quite provocative, but has come from various post-colonial uh, you know, theorists of capitalist development, where particularly Kanyal, uh, Kalyan Sanal and Partha Chatterjee, who talk about that these kind of interventions which are supported by World Bank and International Monetary Fund. We're talking about the new way in which development happens, where this old idea of structural transformation and making people be a part of formal workforce is kind of lost. That sort of, uh, you know, sort of uh, old idea of capitalism and success of capitalism is pretty much given up. That's not even happening in the economies of the global north. What has now come into being by way of these interventions, by way of conditional cash transfers, microcredit programs, so on and so forth, is basically a management of the poor. You want political stability in countries, and what you cannot provide is secure livelihoods to people. And if you cannot provide secure livelihoods, you don't want a workforce that, you don't want a population that's going to be militant and destabilize the economic system. So capital for its own stability needs to make certain kinds of negotiations with this population, a lot of which in fact happens in the form of these kind of small loans and so on and so forth. And to be very frank, this kind of negotiation has worked so well for the rise of right-wing governments in various parts of the world because they don't want to bring about changes in structures of the economy. All you need to give is certain kind of doles and charities to these people without even providing employment to these people. You give them doles and charities and they think that the government has come out from its magnanimity of trying to vouch for us. So what we are doing is trying to manage that political stability by what is called the governance of the poor. And that's what, sorry to say, I'm a World Bank and these institutions with a lot of these pushing of these development intervention facilitated by RCT kind of programs are doing. Very provocative, but that's kind of my reading. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I always think that, um, you know, that they tend to run the most RCTs on the poorest people, right? And I think there was a stat, um, I think Angus Dayton, who's a mainstream guy who's quite a good critique of, a fierce critic of RCTs, he said that it was about... 75% of RCTs are run by like the world's richest on the world's poorest. And the simple fact is that if you have like political and economic power, then it's not as possible for someone to run a randomized control trial on you. So, you know, you, you've mentioned intellectual property. If you said to, you know, a bunch of corporations, all right, we're going to cancel all your IP laws and the the rest of you will be a control group and we're going to you're going to get to keep your ip laws i mean there's literally no way that could happen right there's there's just they have too too much political power too much economic power for you to do that and yet you can play with the lives of poor people you know give give them um uh, some of them some money and some of them not some money in some cases they actually seem to do Cut, cut off their water yes you beat me to it davika yet sometimes they do really actually actively bad things there was there was one in the qje the quarterly journal of economics about how they partnered with missionaries um i can't was it in kenya and they I think it was in the philippines in the philippines um yeah they partnered with missionaries and they they randomly allocated some households to to uh for the missionaries to actually go to uh to engage in the missionary work and then they they took some, some, and uh, they said, "Don't go there." And they looked at the effect of it on, like, the Protestant, 
on Protestantism, maybe even the Protestant work, work ethic. I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm a bit hazy on the details, but those ones come out every so often and you just realise that it is, it is something that the powerful can do to the powerless, right? I mean, didn't they also uh, incentivize students in Hong Kong to go protest? Oh um, my God, they did, didn't they? Yes. Yeah, they did. And this is a state which kind of monitors like who's at, I mean, all states do, but Hong Kong, the, they have, you know, high, like facial recognition technology to be doing this. And a lot of people risked a lot by going to pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong, which is fine. Like if they want to protest, that's their prerogative. But I, I don't know, getting the money incentives to do that seems a bit... I mean, it's certainly a political question, isn't it? It speaks to yes. your point, right? You know, you're going to manipulate the the politics of of, of countries, right, directly. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, I mean, this this kind of leads me to, uh, to a big question that I, I've been wondering. Would you say, both of you, is is decolonization inherently anti-capitalist? <laughs> what, what do you think? <laughs> um, I think yes. I think decolonization is essentially a radical project, <laughs> and that's kind of my take on it. Of course, uh, are we talking about ways in which we can colonize, uh, we can decolonize, we can definitely colonize within the existing structures, but can we decolonize within uh, the existing structures? There are certain ways that we make advancements, so on and so forth. However, one thing that I would want to say is if one takes the takes this sort of stance and, uh, you know, and it's a completely theoretical stance that is capitalism per se, a system that facilitates various processes of colonization, then are we talking about a system that does not facilitate it? So it's basically a question as simple as that. We are talking about whether there are production structures, uh, the way uh, institutions are organized, so on and so forth. To what extent do they facilitate and to what extent do they inhibit the process of colonization? And uh, I guess that's where we can theoretically try to answer that question. Where do we go away, uh, from there? To what extent, to what kind of radical changes any of us is personally and politically capable of taking is a different question. But I guess for, for as, as someone who's an economist, I guess for me, that's kind of the beginning uh, point of inquiry that exists. So, uh, so so yeah I, I you know like it, it is essentially a radical project and that's why you know we often say that mainstream can diversify but not decolonize uh and mm -hmm. i'll leave uh Thevika to take off from that. yeah i completely agree and, and again this isn't we don't even need to go to the political of it as Serbi said theoretically i think we can show that it is um and i mean for all with all the mechanisms that we've spoken about and sort of the edifice of common knowledge or um, established wisdom that economists are creating. Um, much of that is consistent with the processes of capitalism, which, and if you were to decolonize economics or decolonize society, uh, it's hard to see how those processes would still exist. So, yeah short answer <laughs> <laughs> um yeah okay so i mean what what are perhaps so we talk a lot about like structures right um so uh, maybe could you give me like some examples of some of the structures which i guess are capitalist structures that would need to be changed and dismantled and i know you have you have alluded to these throughout but uh just to make them very clear like what what are some of the structures that we'd like to see dismantled um in order to achieve decolonization as in in economics or real world oh sorry in the in the real world i meant kind of yeah more kind of policy institutions that kind of thing okay i mean so but you can you can take it after i just have one example that comes to the top of my head because you were just talking about like um, the management of the poor should, should be very eloquent, but it, um, in that, well, you know, once we identify that poverty is structural and it's not about personal choice, it's not about culture, you can't like, like you can't, I don't know, out culture or out tweak your way out of poverty. 
uh, that you know you you can't save your way out of poverty, like the idea of you know that we need to teach the poor financial literacy or financial management when they, they don't have much finance to manage to begin with. Um, as as and we can think of like a lot. Say if a state wanted to do a lot to alleviate the conditions of poverty within their own sort of nation economy, whatever. Um, they could, however, a lot of developing countries are really constrained in terms of their fiscal space because of um, all kinds of external constraints. One of them being um, the IMF World Bank and the consensus around good financial management, the consensus around like, oh my God, we're so scared of government debt. Government debt is so bad, uh, that, that kind of consensus. So these are real world examples in which which I don't see as con that those are very consistent with capitalism um, and how like full employment management of like achievement of full employment, how that's anti-capitalist. You can read in the work of Mikhail Kalechki, who pointed out that full employment is not in the interests of um, the capitalist class because then they don't have a, a, a large pool of unemployed people to discipline labor. This is one of my favorite, most favorite article in all of economics of all time. Me too. I know how Me too. <laughs> But it's great. But that's the point. Like, so if you, if you actually, if a state really wanted to, and and to an extent, I'm not taking a political position here, but like the Chinese state has done to a large extent, of course, with horrible political repression as well. But they have, over several decades, definitely improved the lives of poor people in their economy because they've chosen a path that that is not necessarily anti-capitalist. Absolutely not. I don't think China is not a capitalist country. However, they're willing to sort of like but the norm, do what they want, and not necessarily listen to the um, powers of global finance who vote so, on their feet. So, yeah, so the, you mentioned that, sorry, uh, Devika, were, no, were you going to carry on? Uh, sorry, no, I, no, I no. just wanted to, um, uh, you, you, you mentioned China, and someone in the chat did, and I, I, um, oh, okay. I was going to kind of mention it myself. So just to play devil's advocate, on the issue of decolonization and capitalism, mm -hmm. it if if you speak to fans of capitalism, um, mm -hmm. they will tell you that there has been a large reduction in poverty over the past few decades, mm -hmm. um, and China certainly, like you said, it's not it's not following a Western model of capitalism. Let's put it that way, right? But it is capitalist. It is capitalist, and Absolutely. other countries, other um, you know, success stories in terms of in terms of the growth of their income, anyway, is South Korea. Um, as well, and and the the um, East Asian tigers, right? And um, more recently, I think um, people are, are talking about um, the growth in 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 Bangladesh as well. Um, and there's other countries, I think Ghana, that are gro growing quite fast. And all of this is to say, is it capitalism as such, or is it that is it the kind of Western dominated model of capitalism? Um, that needs to be dismantled because these would seem to provide counterexamples to show that some types of capitalism can um, can can be kind of decolonial, I suppose. Right. Okay, that's a, that's a great way to put it. Uh, I love the question. Um, well, I would I, I would push you to think of what are the policies that in all of these contexts have actually help the lives of the poor? Is it the free market policies? Is it that you give them access to bank accounts and not like incomes and jobs? Or what, what are these policies that have actually in South Korea, in Ghana, in Bangladesh, in China, actually helped with poverty alleviation, like sustainably? Not that you know that you're not um, that not like one one day you have you have enough, you're above the poverty line, and the next day you you're, there's somebody in your family who has a health emergency, and suddenly you're back like in a very difficult position. Sustainably, we need to see what are the policies that actually have and. I, I can't speak to all the specific contexts, but I doubt if they are consistent with the logic of the, what, the, what mainstream economics says is the path to poverty alleviation through, I don't know, just making the cap, the, their, their lives more capitalist that you sort of, yeah, you know, like most of them, most of the policies that work are providing public housing, providing income transfer, providing jobs. And those are, I don't, are they really consistent with sort of um, free market capitalism? Of course, they're not like necessarily free market capitalism and you can have varieties of capitalism and this is a variety of capitalism, as you said. Um, um, and so, but as we said, they're not in itself perfect, right? We would want 
better. We want better. We want more inclusive. We want more things. <laughs> I mean, I, it's, a, it's so cheesy. I always quote Bridget Jones, which sort of ages me. We want it all. Like, we absolutely want it all. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, I'm not saying, I don't think there can be a decolonial capitalism, because if you look at like, post-colonial capitalism in various countries, it's been absolutely horrendous. Like, if you look at, I mean, I'm from India, and every day looking at India just saddens me, because it's, it's just like, every day of one day of hell after another for people who are there. And I can get to say this sitting, sitting in Los Angeles, completely immune and protected because I had the privilege of leaving. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's not like, that's not sort of some panacea just because it's decolonial. I, I don't think it is or post-colonial or whatever you want to add, whatever you want to call it. So and maybe that's not a straight answer. Is it, I, I suppose, I I suppose <laughs> the question um, is, could you foresee a capitalism where every country has pursued some policies similar, at least let's say in spirit, to, to these, these um, success stories as they're often painted, and essentially every country has attained a level of income that is at least comparable to the richer countries under capitalism because they've, you know been allowed to engage in protectionism and um you know things like that and maybe maybe even the u.s dollar isn't the dominant currency anymore and we have a more democratic one but it's still capitalism i mean can can you see that happening does that because that strikes i actually think that strikes me as possible likely not not likely <laughs> not likely but possible right okay that's a that's a good honestly maybe but I also think a world like that would look radically different from what we have right now. If we actually were in a system in which uh, basically all countries of the world could do, had the power or were allowed to do what China did, right? Um, I think trade would look different. I think supply chains would look different. I don't think a lot of like big firms would be as profitable as they are now if they couldn't depend on like value chains in which which are necessarily in a Marxist sense, exploitative, like extraction of surplus value, exploitative, um, which is contingent on like suppression of wage, wages in the rest of the world. So mm. if we could be in a place where you could actually industrialize and raise the productivity of workers and provide like mass and provide jobs to everyone, I don't know what that work will look like because it's so different from what we have right now. Um, maybe, I think that's completely possible. I think it's think we're thinking of um, robust welfare state, social democracy, capitalism everywhere. Maybe. <laughs> can I take a, I, yeah, can I take a slightly Please. different position though? Uh, it, you know, like from US, which has been kind of had a Fordist sort of period, which was called the golden age of capitalist accumulation where everybody had rising wages, right, wages were tethered to productivity, so on and so forth. However, I think theoretically what Marxian theory would say is that capitalism in itself is a contradictory system. So you can have these phases and you can have these different phases. First, the happening of these phases is extremely contingent. China, I think, is a very specific case that comes into the global market at the time. One, it has the whole history of huge investment in health and education. But second, also, it comes in the global market at a time when there is, in fact, US needing a lot of cheap consumption goods and various global North economies needing the cheap consumption goods. And China is able to come and kind of fulfill that gap in some ways. So in that sense, China's rise, I feel, is very contingent. And similarly, are, are the rise of other countries, per se. Second is, even when we look at the countries that are quote unquote developed, where there are uh, higher income, so on and so forth, that was a particular phase of capitalism. And the moment that this was not profitable for capital, we do see a breakdown of that entire Fordist period that happens and capital flies out and goes to these global South economies and starts to exploit them. China goes to um, various African economies and now is exploiting their labor. So it is in fact... I feel that within capitalism, you can have phases of stability, you can have different social orders, you had something which was prior to the World War II phase of capitalism, 
you had something which was the world order between 40s and 70s, which is this for this period in global north and a very industrial policy sort of idea and structural change sort of policies in the global south. Post 70s, you have these liberalization reforms that are coming into being and we have this neoliberal period in post 2008 is what, uh, you know, in Gramsci's word and what Nancy Fraser's and others would characterize as an interregnum. That is, we are stuck. We are kind of the morbid symptoms of the system are kind of starting to appear without really leading to any resolution. My point is you can have these phases, which will be good for some, bad for some, stability, not stability, so on and so forth. One, I have seen what capitalist transition could achieve in the US and what it in fact did. We are looking at basically a US economy now with such huge levels of labor precarity, like almost, I don't know, one third, like, a very significant proportion of the workforce is in fact in gig and platform economy. So it is like for the global South economies, that is kind of what you call the imagination. Mm. But we're seeing what the imagination is right now. We're seeing the high levels of precarity. We don't, so one is the people who have undergone that imagination or have achieved that, they are back to those levels, not back, but they are in fact falling into these level of precarity because labor is in surplus globally. So even if you do not have enough labor or there's a tight labor market in the US, so to say, you would actually, the labor would go elsewhere. Across globally, there's actually a narrowing down of wage gaps across people in the world. And a lot of that is happening because, uh, you know, wages in the rich countries have been, particularly in the US economy, which is so shown as the success case of capitalism, has been falling. So my my only submission here is that those are just periods of capitalism that doesn't define capitalism. Capitalism inherently is a contradictory system, Mm -hmm. which even after these periods of stabilization will lead to certain other uh, crisis. And it is a crisis ridden system. That was so great to read. (laughs) (laughs) Thanks, Sammy. No, that was really good. Um, Yeah, I think so. Capitalism has always been very uneven, right? Capitalist development has always been very uneven. And there has always been this issue of precarity, uh, as you put it. And I think you're kind of saying that. I, I guess it's a bit like uh, it's a bit like when there's like a lump of air in the carpet, and you kind of uh, you stomp it down, and it comes back up somewhere else, right? It's uh, the the precarity, the inequality, the exploitation are always going to appear somewhere, right? Um, so yeah, thank you. Um, it was really, really, really well put there. Um, yeah, so I mean, we've kind of um, we kind of uh, hit the big questions like straight away. <laughs> but I think one thing I, I want to do is is put my, um, my put my curriculum hat on um, because we've talked about the big political questions and whether you can have decolonization without answering answering those, uh, and it seems the answer is no. But also in terms of the economics curriculum. Because I'm really interested in this. Like, what what kind of specific changes would you like to see? What would be like a typical education for you know, let's say a first year economics student in a in a fully decolonized curriculum? What would that look like? Um, okay, it's while Sir B is gathering her thoughts. So I think it's very hard to say what it would look like because I don't think decolonization would look the same everywhere. I think it has specific characteristics in the global north and it would look a certain way in the global north and it would look a certain way somewhere else. So, but in general, um, I think, um, I think it's very important instead to start from like demand supply, individualized sort of getting students already to think from that sort of atomized um, marginal utility theory perspective is to instead start thinking from like power and maybe class analysis or racial group analysis, or I think that should be the starting point from which you can follow, like a lot of other things can build, be built up from that. Uh, I know that's a vague answer, but, um, but I think it lends itself to what we would want to achieve because the only type of power and this is a this is a discussion that Serbia and I've had for a while, and we hope to write this uh, soon. Is that the only kind of power economics is really theorized? Mainstream economics is market power, and only like imperfectly. No other form of power, structural power, has something that it's something that like economics has sufficiently theorized. And if again, like we had 
more students, again, and the large majority of students who study economics are not necessarily, you know, getting a master's in economics. They're usually going to be undergraduate students who take a series of undergraduate introductory or intermediate courses in economics. So those are the ones we need to target. <laughs> and there you need to have a more systemic analysis of like power and, um, you know, uh, how does an economy work? Like when you are going to work, what does that mean? You know, and again, I'm, 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 I'm sort of revealing my um, ideological and theoretical leanings here. I'm fine with it, <laughs> but sort of to understand the labor process, all of those things, which affect all of our lives and are at the end of the day, central to our economy is where I would start rather than this abstract demand supply utility. Because I remember taking undergraduate courses in economics and that's where we started. And you know, once you had to do more critical work, it's basically you have to unlearn all of that. Ha <laughs> ha, unlearning economics. <laughs> <laughs> and so, which is such a waste of my time now, I think, because uh, it didn't really add anything. Um, anyway, that was a roundabout and not clear answer. Serbi is expert, she'll tell us. <laughs> I am no more of an expert than you, Erica. Uh, pretty much less in many, uh, you know, uh, areas. But uh, let me just kind of build on something that you said. I guess for me, you know, an economics curriculum begins with talking to students about what is it that different theoretical entry points to a theory can allow you to understand. So, for example, um, I tend to structure my courses in a way so that even if you're looking at issue of identity or policy or so on and so forth you can start the entire course by talking about let's say some key theoretical uh, frameworks and looking at how each of these key theoretical frameworks have been understanding these processes i usually start with telling students about okay this is a neoclassical framework where the starting points and the entry points are individual preference resource endowment and technology and how do you build theories from these building blocks for keynesian you could, you can start with math psychology power of institutions animal spirits and uh, you know governing investment decisions and then how do you build a theory if you start from this? Similarly, if you start from class as a process of production, appropriation, and distribution of surplus, how is it that from these theoretical building blocks can you understand same economic processes? And then let's say you're doing a course on identity, just as an example, and you start with, okay, let's start with these entry points and say what do from these entry points each of the theories tell us about the processes of identity. What is it that they are able to reveal? What is it that they, that they uh, obfuscate? And, what, and how do we change these, uh, to what extent, or how do we reach a particular understanding from these entry points? And similarly contrast it, let's say, with the Marxian theory and see to what extent it allows us to answer the question, the same object of uh, analysis that we have, let's say an issue of poverty. How would an individualizing paradigm begin with understanding the issue of poverty? And what kind of issues of poverty does, let's say, a Marxian framework really uh, reveal that the other one would not? And what, you know, to what extent can they be combined with each other? To what extent are they distinct from each other? And for me, that kind of understanding, these different schools of thought and looking at different processes from these different schools of thought is something that I think designing a curriculum can be very interesting and actually goes with that pluralist agenda. And then, of course, the question comes, which of these schools of thought then lend themselves to actually creating more decolonial sort of uh, knowledge processes. So even when we're talking about understanding the realities in post-colonial economies, how do we understand that if we were starting from individual individualizing paradigm, of course, you'll be able to answer and you'll be able to answer some really interesting questions from that as well. But what is it that a Marxian theory of entry point would reveal us about the same processes when we are trying to understand the post-colonial theories, uh, post-colonial realities? So that would kind of be my entry point and that's how I would structure the entire course. So it'll be about these theories, how these theories understand different issues, and what is kind of the solutions or the way forward or policy emanating from each of those theories. And to what extent do they allow us to understand post-colonial realities and decolonial ways of looking at the issues of various issues, whatever you're studying, let's say even if you're studying issues of labor. And in that context, I think it becomes important how sometimes South-centric strands or frameworks that lend themselves to decolonization might be so much better suited to even understand the processes of labor in the global North. Because as I said, it's the essence of capitalism, which is Eurocentric. 
mm-hmm. and not ne- because you know we're in a world where there's a south in every north and a north in every south and <laughs> that's something that we're trying to unpack yeah yeah absolutely i mean i i, I think i tend to agree with that approach to education uh introducing students to different ways of approaching the topic um can um well firstly it's as we said right at the beginning right it's a scientific thing right you're talking about there are different um as elements to reality reality is complex there are different ways of approaching it uh but also from a purely pedagogical pedagogical I can never say that word perspective um it's um it allows them to contrast right and it allows them to develop their critical thinking and learn to interrogate the assumptions behind different theories i mean one one thought i did have serbi um on on your uh proposed curriculum uh it is uh it does sound quite complex and like there's quite a lot there right if you've got many different theories for students to contrast i mean it's enough just learning one for a lot of them right <laughs> and so is there how can we deal with that as like pluralists uh, you know, who want to change economics education? Um, so that's an interesting question. I, my own sense is that we don't all, we can never be exhaustive in our teaching. You know, you have your 12-week courses or your 15-week courses. We cannot aim to be exhaustive. But the point is, to what extent are we able to equip students with frameworks and tools of their frameworks such that if they know that, they will be able to analyze any given object at any particular point in time. Of course, there'll have to be tweaks made and you know so on and so forth. However, the idea is that if we know frameworks, we can read papers in economics, we can read literature in economics. It's basically to know and be versed in that language such mm. that we can pick up things even for further reading. So a lot of times it's about introducing students to framework, telling them the logic of the theory, telling them and doing some examples mm. of, uh, you know, picking up five, six different examples that happened over history to analyze that and then letting them uh, work with it. Mm. I would prefer that way more than just being like, okay, let me not teach you any Marxian theory or Keynesian theory and just teach you neoclassical theory and try to, and now you try and understand how the world works. You can give them 10 examples, 10 real world examples, but they've actually lost out on exactly different frameworks, which could make sense of, uh, you know, things very, very differently. So you Mm -hmm. could cut down on what you are telling in terms of concrete examples to students, but do always teach them the frameworks, their languages and the tools for that. That would be for me the priority. Interesting. So that's, oh, sorry, carry on, please. No, sorry. I mean, I was, I guess... I guess what I teach is quite different from what Serbi teaches because Serbi has a more labor development micro and I'm more of a finance international trade macro person. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times like I like to um, sort of get students to discover the key insight. So I remember I was teaching trade in the summer, international trade class on international trade in the summer. And so, you know, uh, I wanted to make the point that, and I guess I'm, I'm, I, I swear I'm going to get to a pedagogical point real quick. Uh, I wanted to make the point that a lot of trade patterns aren't because of like, you just open the economy and then you just trade what you're, you know, the, com- in w- the good or commodity or service in which you have a comparative advantage. And, um, and also like the link to development and growth. Um, and, you know, I think it's a well-known fact. This is the work of uh, Eric Reiner, Tarjan Chang. A lot of people have made this fact that what you exported matters. And um, countries that exported like high value added goods are now richer. Um, and you can see that pattern in the um, um, in existing trade patterns. So I kind of like directed them <laughs> to the right data sources to be like, hey, why don't you why don't you look at the countries that are rich today? Like find me their per capita income. And I had like about 20 students in this class. It was a small class. And I asked them each to pick a, a, a rich country and a poor country. What is their per capita income today? And what do they trade? You could immediately see a pattern <laughs> without me introducing any theory. And so, yeah, I mean, I like to get like, get them get them to get their hands dirty, which serves a dual perspective pur- purpose of also like being critical about what you see in terms of images and graphs and figures. What are the axes? What are they looking at? What are the data sources, etc.? And then sort of like placing it in theories, which often like I don't only give them one theory; I give them many theories as well. But at the end of the day, like it's the job of the instructor to consolidate that, so it's not that students are left with just like 
disparate theories, disparate facts, and no real like understanding, like consistent understanding. That's our job as instructors to make sure that we can tie a thread through all of the lessons that we deliver. Uh, but yeah, I try to, as it's again a pedagogical tool, like get yeah. them yeah. to find out what they think and then sort of place that in the theories that we have. So, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so th- th- those are two kind of contrasting approaches to how to how to do it, right? Um, one kind of introduces uh, a whole um, a load of different theories, um, and you know, to probably I- I'm guessing Serbi would think a lot about methodology and, and epistemology and right, like how how we approach economics um, as a whole and especially theory, um, whereas the other one sort of tells goes data first. Um, and t- and tells them to like get to grips with the data and figure things out. Um, I mean, uh, you know, there's obviously if those are two separate modules, there's room for both of those on on the curriculum, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. So I mean, one one thing um, I wanted to ask Vika. This is a bit of a. I mean, it's it's related, but this is a, a little bit of a tangent. But because your research is on exchange rates, right, um, I've been looking at it today, and you also talk a lot about central banks mm-hmm. and how they facilitate um, the global exchange system. Um, mm-hmm. So often central, blank, central banks uh, in, the, in the global north will have very easily used swap facilities yeah. to swap, you know, dollars for euros and for pounds or whatever, mm-hmm. to the extent that that's... Generally speaking, it's not really a problem for the UK if they need to get hold of some dollars. They can just swap it directly at the Federal Reserve, right? Almost as if they're like a bank in the US or something. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I guess, I guess number one, I could just, I, I'd really like to hear more about that. Um, my second follow-up question would be about the the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how. How if 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 you're uh, if you're you know um, want to talk about that and how um, how how crucial and central those central bank swaps have been in the Russian in the sanctions on Russia, right? Oh right, that's such a great question. So yes, I mean um, my one of my favorite things that I did during my dissertation was write this paper about the determinants of like what determines which countries get access to this unlimited liquidity facility in the global reserve currency, which is the US dollar from the Fed or the US government, um, the federal government of the United States. And uh, I guess it's no surprises that a lot of it had to do with political alignment and a certain policy orientation of the countries in question, and they were more likely to get the support than other countries. Uh, And I document this, I've given a lot of examples in my paper, so feel free to read that. Um, But yeah, effectively, like a country like the UK or the European, uh, or the European Union, uh, which again, now both the ECB and the Bank of England have a standing facility with the Fed, that they can borrow an unlimited amount of dollars, an unlimited amount at any given time. So like that's been institutionalized with five five central banks, the ECB, the Bank of England, the Swiss National Bank, uh, Canada, <laughs> and I want to say, which is the fifth one? I'm forgetting. Japan, Bank of Japan. Um, and so they can, but the rest of, uh, all of the rest of the world have to manage the um, vagaries of the of international finance on their own so they do this with a variety of like reserve accumulation or creating other arrangements with other central banks that do have dollars but at the end of the day it's all about do you have the dollar or not and um and so yeah i, I think that this is a highly unequal system it's also a highly unstable system we can see stability instability cropping up everywhere so even if again like even if you didn't care about, give a, give a rat's ass about justice, about une- inequality. It's just unstable that, that an inefficient, that now um, the Fed, if now again, the Fed continues to raise interest rates, you're gonna see a lot of capital flowing out of um, developing economies and they're gonna have to step up and sort of defend their currencies because um, they don't have to, they could let them collapse, but they could, there would be other implications of that. And so as a result, a lot of central banks are going to step up to manage their exchange rate when that happens. And it's already happening. There's already sort of an outflow of capital happening from developing countries for a variety of reasons. Um, and so, 
yeah, they have to inefficiently <laughs> manage reserves, manage their exchange rates. When the more efficient system is what that you could just borrow as from the lender of last resort, which is how all banking system works everywhere. Like as it's how, how all national banking systems work where they don't have a problem of currency. Um, so, so, I mean, that's just the question of dollar dominance. Uh, I don't think the dollar dominance has been necessarily undermined by the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the subsequent sanctions on the uh, Russian central bank. However, it's definitely unprecedented in terms of volume because before now, when um, the government, the federal government or the Fed has done something such as this, it's always been countries with smaller reserves, with smaller economies like Afghanistan most recently when, um, when uh, the federal government sort of froze the assets of the uh, Afghan central bank, which were $7 billion. Uh, the Russian central bank had $650 billion in reserves that it froze. And so that's a substantial, that's a large economy that is in a way unprecedented in the modern. And again, like the modern monetary system isn't very old, it's about a hundred years old. So it's still unprecedented. Mm. Um, I don't, I mean, I'm not, I'm not familiar with whether the swap agreements have been used to, to stabilize other countries that have sanctioned uh, the Russian government, Russian central bank, et cetera, because actually the a lot of people are saying, you know, again, if you if you read the macro types, I read, <laughs> they're saying that um, um, that a lot of sanctions have been ineffective because the German dependence on Russian oil and a lot of other uh, countries not supporting sanctions. And interestingly enough, I think the idea that these sanctions are global is a misnomer. Most countries of the global south have not sanctioned Russia. And this is not sort of a moral position. It's more of a instrumentalist position. Like suddenly the U.S. opposition to the Venezuelan regime has gone away because now they need Venezuelan oil. Um, mm. But when, when, when countries of the global south do the same, it's like, oh my God, God, they're immoral look at these heathens you know they don't want to they don't want to take a stand against russian invasion which is once again not true um but does this mean that this is the end of the dollar i doubt it because mm. the dollar is entrenched and it's very strong um and even i do think it is the i think like it's hard to predict and i i honestly cannot predict like it could be that this is sort of the period of chaos that we saw yeah. in the transition between the pound as a reserve currency, the pound sterling, and the dollar, which was kind of the interwar period, which was very chaotic, prone to instability. And of course, there were actual wars that were taking place then, not that we don't have a war right now. Um, but we don't know what the contours would look like on the other side and how long that period of instability will be. What we definitely can say that there are other regimes like emerging, like if Rush, if the Russian government can actually create exchange and exchange in rubles for with other countries that are willing to trade with them, then it might create sort of another axis of um, currency exchange, which is different and definitely challenging the dollar dominance. But I don't think it's big enough. I don't think the Russian economy is strong enough. Neither is the Chinese renminbi. I think it's not even on the horizon hmm. um, strong enough. If hypothetically, again, now we're thinking complete pipe dream. If we had a global alliance or of global South countries that would be like, nope, we're gonna trade in our own currency. We don't, we don't want to trade with you, which for a lot of reasons is not gonna happen anytime soon. Um, then I would say that there's an actual challenge to dollar dominance, but unless there's actual a coalition against it, which is not, which is outside of the dollar Eurosphere, uh, I don't see it happening. But I think things are changing very quickly we don't know, uh, and yeah, I, I'm 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 gonna I'm gonna give mm. you an unsatisfactory answer in that. Mostly, I don't know, but no, those are I my mean, general thoughts about it. Yeah, no, thank you. That was really comprehensive, and I asked you uh, two really big questions at once, and so you know, it was a it was a really good answer. I mean, just just to hammer this point home, right? Because we've been talking about the dominance of the IMF, and and one of the things I think. Uh, underpins and uh, you know uh, uh, you uh, you two can correct me if i'm wrong but one of the things i think kind of underpins the dominance of the imf is actually the dominance of the dollar Absolutely. because because the countries need dollars because the yes. global economy is run on dollars and often co poorer countries and i think this is really acutely true in latin america um they need to conduct conduct some of their transactions in dollars uh, even internally um, and with financial institutions and mo the biggest banks are usually American or, or maybe maybe European. Um, mm -hmm. And so they need these currencies, especially the dollar, 
mm-hmm. to to have economies literally to do to do almost anything right and 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 that's before you even get into what they need to import in terms of you know um uh you know certain types of goods that they don't make themselves so the fact that these countries have literally gone through some of the worst crises in terms of you're talking about you know hyperinflation uh you're talking about you know really the most severe austerity programs inflicted on them in exchange for loans of dollars that they need the fact that those countries have gone through those things and yet now and i think since about since the 2008 crisis i think most rich countries can simply get infinite dollars right yep just just because they're a member of the club mm-hmm. is is a real insult for a start but also a pretty good demonstration of right of like how how the dollar and the west or the global north uh, uh, kind of dominate the the global system yes hmm. that was a great articulation yeah. really <laughs> <laughs> um thank you um so uh, serbi um uh, did you kind of want to uh, to add add on that question and no devika's expert i'm, I'm yeah. happy to yeah yeah Absolutely. Um no, great great answers. Um so yeah. So one thing uh which you talked about a little bit uh Serbi and uh, how how do you do you guys kind of have to go soon or or what's your situation? Um in a little bit. Yes. In a little yeah. bit is is yeah. a little bit half an hour or is it under half an hour? <laughs> um so it's 9:37 here. Yeah. I definitely have to stop at 10. You definitely have to stop at 10. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I, I'll need to st- stop in under 10 minutes. I'm very sorry. All right. All right. No. So I'll tell you what I'll do because people have been asking some very good questions in the chat. So if you two, and I've ignored them all because I've been so interested in speaking to you, but people, if you asked a question before, it won't have been repeated because I didn't repeat anyone's questions. Please give us your questions for the next 10 minutes um, before Serbi and, and Davika have to, have to leave. So let me, I can start with one that was above, no, people spamming MMTers, honestly, they're everywhere, aren't they? (laughs) Just spamming my chat. Right, okay. (laughs) Um, Okay, so, so, K-Pass asks, is there utility to making economics more interdisciplinary, making certain courses in other departments degree requirements? Should we go, you say? <laughs> yes, I mean, short answer is yes. Uh, the long answer is that economics was never supposed to be like just something which is of a domain, which is market or, you know, market-like transactions. It was never supposed to be that. The economics of the subject was that about political economy, which of course had so many understandings from... I mean, economics doesn't work in isolation, right? No matter how much the economics imperialists want to believe that as if you can understand even the households from market-like interactions, that's not how it happens. Economics is in fact embedded in various social processes and various other non, quote-unquote non-economic social processes. And the idea is to again think about uh, frameworks which allow us to re-embed it back in those social processes and therefore have an understanding of politics, of geography, of history and uh, legality and so on and so forth to understand how economics as a sphere operates and functions. And often in trying to distance economics from that in order to see ourselves as the queen of social sciences, which can look (laughs) down upon all other social sciences, there's this, uh, yeah, I mean, there's this basically uh, embedded idea that we are in some ways distant. We're not, we're totally embedded. And if you're not understanding those processes, you're not understanding economics. You're understanding a lab experiment, which you might as well, uh, you know, you don't need to be a part of the social, social science that is economics to do that. Uh, very quickly, I have to add, I agree with Subhu entirely. And also, um, when I was doing my master's, I took several courses in political philosophy that helped me sort of like challenge what I know in my own head and also give me a lot more insight into, I don't know, a lot of, I think a lot of what I think today is very dependent on the fact that I did take courses outside of my field and just sort of like had a critical lens to what I was learning. So mm. yeah, very important. Yeah. Yeah, very good answers. Thank you. Okay. Um, Miss Moon Mage asks, 
What I'm wondering is what we can do in economics to change our understanding of development to recognize pre-modern non-capitalist economies like those of pre-colonization North America? Such a good question. I, I'm excited to hear the answer. <laughs> They're being the expert on this, so. Um, no, I'm actually no, I'm actually not. I'm, I'm, I can say much about post-colonial economies, but probably not about uh, pre-colonization you know, US and stuff. Of course, there's been, uh, I think there's, so in general, I don't think the idea is in general, when I'm talking about development, a celebration of what is quote unquote pre-modern or quote unquote, you know, we want better livelihoods for people. There is electricity, there's less poverty and so on and so forth. And I don't think that is something that we need to necessarily give away, right? Like the question isn't that. The question is when there is technological advancement, what are the kind of production structures that exist such that there is this difference between haves and have nots. Mm -hmm. And when we are talking about, the problem isn't that we don't have enough wealth in the world. We do want more wealth and more uh, economic progress in the world. We have a problem with how, how apolitically this idea of progress is defined. And we have a problem with talking about that uh, this is the kind of structure or this is the kind of system that is the best that we can get, which when it is not. And when we talk about underdevelopment in global South economies, the implicit assumption is that as if those are naturally occurring state of affairs and we have to go and be what the US is right now. Or, no, it's not any underdevelopment. It's a mm -hmm. capitalist underdevelopment. The same process, you know, the kind of insight that comes from dependency theory, the same processes that were producing capitalist development in the global north were producing capitalist underdevelopment in the global south. So I think there's a lot to learn from pre-capitalist societies in terms of how economies were organized and so on and so forth. And I think it's a task worth yeah. doing, but it's also not about going back yeah. in time because there were, of course, you know, so, so think about it that way, this way. There was a lot we didn't know about medical advancements and trying to deal with a lot of uh, viruses and illnesses. But now we're at a point in time when A, we're damaging the ecological balance so much that there's more of this happening. So we need to find a way to combat that. And mm -hmm. second, now even when we have the vaccines, we are not allowing it for everybody to access it. So that is, I think, is the two different uh, kind of questions. So I wouldn't celebrate a pre-modern. I do think we need insights from that in terms of how we engage in our relationships and so on and so forth. But it's not necessarily a celebration of everything that's pre-capitalist or pre-modern. Uh, definitely agree with that. Just wanted to add very briefly that I think a lot of what we think of as sort of pre-modern also is something actually like we all value right now it's just undervalued in in our sort of economy for instance like we all really value being able to breathe clean air or like enjoy nature and just i know i do and i feel like everybody i speak to definitely values that yet like our system is actively destroying all of that so in a way i feel like a conversation with sort of what you think of pre-modern societies is not like we're not advocating a return to sort of like um prehistoric or pre-modern not prehistoric god what am i saying um uh, pre-modern times but more sort of uh yes a conversation and to return to a previous point that we need to be able to learn from not from all not only other disciplines but other groups of people who are not necessarily academics and this could mean indigenous populations and their ways of life we, we need to learn from them it doesn't mean that we all have to return to that kind of form of life it's just yeah because we already value that we just don't value it in your economic system yeah absolutely absolutely thank you do we have time for for one more question should be one more yeah okay so james wisdom uh asks if we're considering the different differing velocities of capital what types of financial tool will be needed to bring about the type of decolonization suggested and i mean i uh, just also to sneak another one in that, that's kind of similar um ai nick M nathan i don't know anyway asks um how do you think decolonial or perhaps progressive global economic institutions and even trade would look um okay the tools tools are, like some of the tools we already have it's like we need to create sort of more policy space for democratically elected hopefully governments who care about their people to do what they need without necessarily subjecting themselves to the demands of financial capital that may not be consistent with what they with what the people who elected them want them to do. 
and also like just from a developmental point of view. And so capital controls just sort of like limiting how much influence they can have. I'm not saying it's a one size fits all policy, but it needs to be on the menu. Like we need to figure out like how can you create policy space? And so institutions that facilitate that, like, a, like a, I think any global system in which you're trading different currencies, which is not a national, we don't have like one currency everywhere. It necessarily needs sort of a global institution that can stabilize stuff. What we have right now is garbage in that in that perspective. So, uh, a more progressive, more egalitarian one that can actually, honestly, like from a very strict macro perspective, you need an international lender of last resort in a way that central banks act for 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 domestic systems. And I'm going back to Walter Badgett to actually define what a central bank should be. It should lend free lend freely at a premium. Uh, against good collateral, not impose conditions, stupid conditions that prevent people, prevent countries from actually benefiting from it. I think that would be a big help. As far as what a progressive trading system would look like, I think a trading system in which, again, like more sort of national autonomy, more autonomy in terms of not only nations, like even within nations, groups of people who want to decide and develop and, you know, give subsidies or protect protect industries or protect jobs and impose labor standards to be given that space and then trading on those terms i think it would look a lot different than what we have right now because a lot of trade right now is also dependent on colonial patterns of trade that were determined under not good conditions (laughs) so uh yeah so that was one answer so yep. did you have anything to add okay no all right thank you um well okay we'll call it there because uh, i don't want you two to miss whatever whatever you're doing next um so thank you so much for coming on the stream it's been really uh informative and fun speaking to you and i'm really grateful uh for institutions like organizations like decon um because it really needs to be done and needs to be said um so yeah thank you thank you so much uh Devika and Serbi it's such a great time thank you so much yes thank you yeah. thank you to you and Devika thanks you. chat as well thanks everybody I will uh see you all soon okay I'm gonna stop the stream now